Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it with me to Isaiah chapter 40. Neil told you I'm here with my wife. We just celebrated 20 years of marriage last month. And so uh, we're here without the kids. So this is really a blessed time. It's my, my first time. We have four kids. And uh, it's my, my first time in Florida. Um, and first time in the, the Sunshine State. Is that right? It's living up to its name. We took a walk on the beach yesterday and checked out Fort Pickens and Navarre Beach and just had a wonderful time out there. You guys are blessed. You know that, right? Calling Florida home and and then getting a tour of the church. I've known Neil, as he mentioned, for about, I guess the, the years start to add up. I think I've known him now for about 20 years and he knew me before my wife and I were even married. And so getting a tour of your church, I was like, I want to come to church here. This place is amazing. How do you ever leave? Um, anyways, it's it's a blessing to be here and and uh, our, our churches are our sister churches, and there's a rich, deep connection, friendship. And anyways, I'm, I'm blessed to be here so, and share, share with you from God's Word. So let's go ahead and, and pray, and we'll get into the Word together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word. It's living, it's powerful, sharper than a double-edged sword. And we pray, the Lord, that you would use the scalpel of your word to cut away all the parts of our lives that don't look like you this morning so that when we leave here, we leave here looking just a little bit more like Jesus. And we pray and ask all of these things according to your mighty name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and and jump into things and, and begin reading there in verse 27 of Isaiah 40. Isaiah writes, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, and say, My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? So this gives us some insight into where the people of Israel were at emotionally. They felt like God had abandoned them, forsaken them. They were demoralized, exhausted, They were on the edge of despair. They felt like God had forsaken them. When they said, my way is hidden from the Lord, they felt like God had turned his back on them. They're expressing some frustration with God's seeming absence. And I just want to start with a question. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt that way? I know um, Neil just talked about the season of life that, that I'm in and having just lost my father a handful of months ago unexpectedly. It's been really hard for me. And there have been points where I've wrestled with the Lord and just said, God, why him? Why now? This, this doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem fair. He had so much life in front of him, so much left to do, so much important kingdom work that he was a part of. And, and just wrestling with those frustrations. And I'm wondering if anyone in this room has, has either found themselves in a place like that in the past, or, or maybe you're right there today. If you have, you're in good company, right? There are those times in life when the hits keep coming. (laughs) I've always loved that quote from the great theologian Mike Tyson. (laughs) You know, you can get good truth from anywhere. He was being interviewed one time prior to a fight, and the interviewer asked him what he thought his opponent's strategy might be against him in the ring. And he said, you know, everyone's got a plan till they get punched in the face. (laughs) (laughs) And that rings true, not just in the boxing ring, but I I think it rings true in life as well. And, And you can have a plan, but sometimes, you know, when everything's going well and believing in God and it's zippity doo dah and there's nothing but rainbows and butterflies but it's easy to praise God in those seasons but then there are those times when life punches you in the face and you can find yourself just like Israel crying out God where are you and the thing that I love about scripture is it invites us to be honest with those struggles with those questions and to bring them to the Lord we see that 
Repeated throughout Scripture, one of the places where this shows up uh, most often is in, in the Psalms. The psalmist often was battling it out in his heart with the Lord about his emotions. And so again, if you're wrestling with despair today, you're not alone. We've all been there before, and if you haven't, just give it some time. You'll get there, I promise. And so in this text, what God does is he, he gives, him some, gives us some things that he wants us to remember. And, and that's the first point in our outline this morning. What God wants you to remember when your life is falling apart. Let's read verses 28 and 29. He says, have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. Somebody say amen. amen. He's the creator of the ends of the earth. He doesn't faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. So Isaiah begins by asking a couple of rhetorical questions. He says to these Israelites, have you not heard? Do you not know? Of course, they knew this stuff, right? They had been raised on these truths about God, these foundational theological truths since the time they were young. But just because you've been raised with a truth doesn't mean that there aren't going to be times when you need to be reminded of said truth. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? We need to be reminded of things continually, especially when it comes to the gospel. Peter wrote these words in his second epistle. This is 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. He said, So, I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. Again, just driving home this idea that we continually need to be put in remembrance of the gospel. Why? We forget. How many times have you forgotten where your sunglasses were only to find them right there on top of your head? (laughs) You know, I I think it was a couple of weeks ago. I was rummaging around the house looking for my keys, yelling at my wife and the kids and the dog and everything else. And then lo and behold, they were in my pocket. That's actually a true story. We forget silly little things, sadly. We forget big, important things things too. And the thing about difficulties and trials is that they have a way of distorting our perspective or our image of who God is. You know how it is if you've ever been to like a carnival or a fair and you stand in front of one of those crazy mirrors, you know what I'm talking about? And they elongate your torso or they shrink your legs and they give you this distorted reflection of reality. And, and I have a, a feeling that that's kind of what happens when we find ourselves in the midst of difficulty. It distorts our perception of who God is and our understanding of him. And, and those things cause us to forget just how big and how mighty and how strong and how faithful he is. And Isaiah knows about that. Which is why he reminds us here of four really basic but really powerful truths about God. The first thing he tells us is that he's from everlasting to everlasting. In other words, God is eternal. Now this is hard for our human finite minds to even grasp. Something that is eternal. In other words, it has no beginning. It has no end. And and it's hard for us because why? We're bound by time. We all had a beginning. We'll all have an end. But God, he's outside of time. In other words, the future isn't a destination to which he's traveling. It's a place he already dwells. And here's why that's good news for us. It means he knows the way your story is going to play out. And if you step back and look at it through the the broader lens, he knows the way the big story is going to play out. And he's told us about it in his word. You can read the book of Revelation, and if I could summarize that entire book for you in two words, it would be these, God wins. (laughs) And that's what we read in the end of the book, but more specifically and personally, as you look at the promises of Scripture, they tell us that, that we win too, if we're on God's team. It says that he who began a good work in you will see it through to completion. And we know that he's working all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purposes. What that means is that everything that's happening to you in your life right now, the good, the bad, and the ugly, it's all coming together to bring about good in you and glory ultimately to him. And that should give us peace. 
that he's everlasting. Secondly, Isaiah reminds these troubled believers that God is omnipotent. I love that. It says he's the creator of the ends of the earth. And sometimes it's good to remind ourselves of the fact that just with a few words, God speaks into existence everything that exists. Think of how big and how powerful that makes him. If you were to back up a little bit in the same chapter that we're looking at, go back with me to verse 25. This is the Lord speaking through the prophet, and look what he says there. He says, to whom will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Isaiah says, walk out on a dark night and look up at the starry host above you and just remind yourself of the fact that God created all of that. He said, let there be light and Light issues forth out of his mouth at a speed of what? 186,000 miles a second. And the universe itself is born. Just a a handful of weeks ago now, um, there was an article in the paper about this new star that scientists had found. And they were really excited about it because it's the most distant star that they've ever seen. And they found it with the Hubble Space Telescope, which is orbiting around the Earth in outer space. And it's this powerful telescope, and it just located the most distant star. How far away is this star? Well, they say it's 12.9 billion light years away. So if you were to take off from Earth and travel at the speed of light, it would take you about 13 billion years to get there. So how far away is that? Well, I had no idea, but there was an accountant that I shared this with, and and he did the math for me. So if he's wrong, you can take it up with him. (laughs) But he told me that that's 76.7 billion quadrillion miles away. Sounds like a number you would make up, right? It's a little kid. That's a billion quadrillion miles away. But that's how far away it is. It's 50 times larger than our sun and millions of times more bright than our sun. And the scientists who found this star gave it a name. They called it Arendelle, which literally translates to the morning star in Old English. Here's, of course, what I love about that. I mean, in Scripture, that's another name for Jesus. He is the bright and morning star. It's as though scientists go to the furthest edges of the most distant galaxy in the known universe. And what did they find? Jesus is there waiting for them. I just love that. And the Bible tells us that Jesus already named that star a long time ago. He put it there. He knows its name and he hasn't lost any of them. He's omnipotent. The next thing Isaiah reminds us of is the fact that God is (laughs) ever-present. I love that. He's, He's always on the job. He never gets tired. He never grows weary. Never needs to take a cat nap. Never clocks out. Never needs to take vacation days. Even in the book of Genesis, where we read about him creating the earth, and then it says on the seventh day God rested. But where it talks about him resting, it's not like God needed you know, the, the break because he was exhausted. He wasn't like, well, I'm exhausted. I need to just kick my feet up for the day. No, no, no. It's, it's a word that speaks of simply he ceased to create. I mean, he could have just kept on going, creating new animals and all kinds of stuff forever and ever. But he stopped because he was like, no, this is, this is good. No, that's so unlike us, right? We need our rest. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. A good nap is a godly thing. That's from the pastor. I read that you'll spend about a third of your life sleeping. You know why I think God designed our bodies in that way? Just so that there would come a point in every day where, regardless of your theological belief systems or anything like that, where you're just forced to rest in the Lord. When you're sleeping, you can't do anything about it. You just have to trust the Lord that he's going to take care of you and keep your respiratory system and cardiovascular system and all of those other systems that make you up running even while you're sleeping. I don't care how resourceful or independent you think you are. We all need our sleep. But here's the good news. While you're sleeping, God is still working. (laughs) I love Psalm 3, verse 5. It says it like this. I lie down and sleep... I wake again. Why? Because the Lord sustains me. Praise the Lord for that. 
He's always on the job. Last thought that Isaiah shares with us or reminds us of is this. He's omniscient. God never says, huh, wow, I didn't see that coming. He knows everything there is to know about every subject there is to know about. I love how Isaiah says his understanding no one can fathom. In other words, God is, and I'm not sure if this is a made-up word or not, but he is unfigureoutable. <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9 puts it like this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. We were just talking about how, how far away that most distant star is. And God looks at that distance and says, yeah, you know, that's a pretty good indication of the distance between your thoughts and my thoughts. You see, we see in part. He sees the big picture. We see through a glass darkly. He sees Everything. He sees all of the potential outcomes and how they're going to play out. He's transcendent. He's eternal. He's all powerful. And those are good things to remind ourselves of. Again, when we find ourselves in the midst of a storm or a trial, because we can look at a situation through our limited, finite understanding of things and say, God, I wouldn't do it like that. That's, that's not a good plan, Lord. Let me, let me suggest some alternative plans for you. And God's saying, child, please, you have no idea. I see everything, and I need you to trust me, which is exactly what the Proverbs tell us to do, to trust him with all of our hearts, not leaning on our own understanding, but in all of our ways, acknowledge him, and then trust that he'll just... He'll put you on the path that's going to lead you into good and lead glory to him. You see, God has infinite capacity, infinite wisdom, infinite power, and infinite strength. We, on the other hand, possess none of those attributes. <laughs> Our capacity is finite. Our strength is limited. And even the strongest and the fittest among us eventually reach our limits. And, and he speaks to that. He, he says, even, even the strongest among you grow faint and weary. Verse 30 talks about that. Even youth shall faint and be weary and young men shall fail and be exhausted. So he talks about young men. He talks about kids. I mean, I've got four kids, as I mentioned, my oldest is 17. My youngest is eight. And, and sometimes, you know, with the eight-year-old, it just feels like they're, she's like an energizer bunny. Just, just go, 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 go. But even at the end of a long day, she'll just conk out and just fall asleep. He talks about young men, you know, and the, the vigor of life when you're in your 20s and you just got all of that energy. He, does, he doesn't mention old people. I think, you know, they're probably like, you know, we get it. You don't even, it goes without saying some things. But there are so many different factors that contribute to the burnout that we inevitably end up running into in life. I'd, I'd like to go over just a few of them. We mentioned one, trials. When you face hardship, certainly those factors have a way of weighing us down. They exhaust us. They erode our strength. And there are times in life when it feels like your get up and go has gotten up and left. <laughs> Trials wear us down. They leave us feeling burnt out. I think age is another one of those obvious things that causes us to just feel that burnout. One of the ways I know I'm getting older is by the injuries I'm sustaining. You know, when you're young, you get injured in cool ways. You're rock climbing or you're surfing or you fall off your bike. Now my injuries come from like sleeping the wrong way or <laughs> from sitting down too long. Like it takes me a while. My wife's like, are you okay? <laughs> The other day, I think I hurt myself by sneezing too hard. I like threw out my back. Like these are the kinds of injuries I'm getting. I'm in my 40s now. And then, of course, there's work. Work weighs us down. It burns us out. Somebody say amen. amen. It's another major contributor to burnout. There was this article written by an economist back in the 1930s. The guy's name was John Maynard Keynes. He entitled the essay, Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. So he was future forecasting what life would look like for his grandkids way back in the 30s. And he talked about how through all the advancements in science and technology in the future, his grandkids would only have to work a 15-hour work week. 
That's us, our generation, by the way. And I just want to ask, how's that going for you? <laughs> right? Everyone I know is busier than ever. You run into somebody, how you doing? Oh, I'm busy. I mean, how, how you doing? Well, I'm busy too. I'm busier than you. We're busy. Everybody's busy. I think part of, a big part of the problem is we end up carrying around work with us in our pockets, through our mobile phones and our tablets. We're always connected, and so we're always essentially on the clock. The giant company indeed conducted a survey of 1,500 U.S. workers and found that over 52% of the respondents said they were experiencing burnout in their jobs. One more thing, and this one's maybe not so obvious, a contributor to the burnout that we experience in life, and that's ministry. You know, ministry is a unique thing. When you're pouring yourself out and, and you're giving yourself away, that can be draining too. I mean, I, I preach three times on a weekend, and, and by the end of that, I'll tell you what, I am not only physically drained, I'm emotionally drained, and then there's a spiritual component to it as well, because you're up here and you're preaching and proclaiming the gospel, and the, the enemy doesn't like that, and so there's an, era, uh, an element of spiritual warfare going on too, and, and all of that can just leave you drained. And I find it interesting that when you look at the gospels, there's this, this really interesting story about Jesus. And you remember the story where he's walking down the street and there's this big crowd around him. The crowds followed Jesus wherever he went and there was a woman in the crowd. And she said, I know that if I can just reach out and touch the hem of his garment, that I'll be healed. And so she fights her way through the crowd and she reaches out and she touches Jesus and she, she's healed and, and Jesus stops in the midst of this thick crowd. And he's like, who touched me? And the disciples are looking at him like, Jesus, you really, you, like for real? Who touched you? Everyone. That's who touched you. And he's like, no, no, no. And Jesus said this in Luke 8, 46. He said, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Power. And some of you know what that feels like. You've reached that point of burnout, right? You're running on fumes. You're burned out from the pandemic. Hello. Burned out from the endless news cycle of bad news. Burned out from the burnout. Burned out from giving and serving. And on and on it goes. As we end this morning, I want to talk to you for a few minutes about how you can beat burnout. How to beat burnout. We see that prescription laid out for us in verse 31. So he's talking about youths faint and young men grow exhausted. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Mm. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. Listen, we are no match for the demands of life. There are always going to be more withdrawals being made from your account than there are going to be deposits. But there's a power to overcome that the Bible talks about. And it's a power that is promised to those who wait on the Lord. Now, I don't like to wait any more than you do. I don't like to wait for my table at a restaurant, which is why I found out you go with Neil. He, they just take you right back to the best table in the place. He knows everybody in this town. It's crazy. I don't like waiting at red lights. I feel like the universe is conspiring against me when I'm sitting at a red light and there's nobody else going. I'm like, really? What's, I don't know. I have problems. Pray for me. Tom Petty, <laughs> Tom Petty saying the waiting is the hardest part. And I think he probably had it right. But the important thing to remember is that while we're waiting, God is working. So why does he make us wait? I think I think he makes us wait because there is a strength that is produced as we struggle. The strength comes from the struggle. That's how you build muscle, right? You, you, you work against the forces of gravity and you flex and contract your muscles and that's how you grow strength. And it works the same way in the spiritual realm. You've all heard of weight training. Some of you guys love to go to the gym, your gym rats. Well, how about weight training? training. As you wait for the Lord to show up, as you wait for his promises to, to come to pass in your life, as you wait on him to be the God that he is and described as in the Bible that builds strength in your heart. Think about all the people that God had wait. It seems to be one of the required courses in our faith journey. 
Abraham had to wait for a promise. Sarah had to wait for a baby. Noah had to wait for a flood. Joseph had to wait to get out of prison. Ruth had to wait for her husband. Mary and Martha had to wait for a resurrection. The disciples had to wait for the Holy Spirit. And we're waiting for the second coming. The point is, if you're going to walk with Jesus, you better learn to be good at waiting on the Lord. But as you wait on him, remember this. Waiting on God it's not a passive activity, right? It's not just sitting there with your hands folded and your legs crossed, just twiddling your thumbs. No, 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 don't think idleness. When you see the word wait in the Bible, it speaks literally of leaning in and waiting with expectancy. Take note of that word expectancy. When I hear of someone who's expecting, oh, I have a friend, she's expecting, a couple is expecting. And what that means is there's a timeline, right? On the delivery of that child. And you think about a couple that's expecting their first baby. They're not just sitting around doing nothing. They're running around and they're nesting and they're building the crib and they're putting together the glider and the pack and play and they're putting in the decorations in the baby room. I mean, there's so much stuff that comes with kids. Like, you got a lot to do. And that's the picture. And when we actively wait, on the Lord, expecting him to show up. That's when we have our strength renewed. And that word renewed there, it's an interesting word. It speaks of an exchange. So we get to exchange our weakness for his strength. He gives us new strength for the struggle. He promises fresh grace for the grind. He gives us promises and supernatural power for the problems that we inevitably face. And then he uses a couple of pictures to drive home that point. He says, you'll mount up with wings like eagles. What a beautiful picture that is. Mounting up with wings like eagles. Um, you know, uh, God could have compared us to any bird. And maybe you don't feel like an eagle. Maybe you feel more like he could have compared you to a turkey or a parrot or a vulture. or I don't know, any one of these birds. But God says, no, no, no. If you wait on me, I'll renew your strength like the eagle. And that's a, that's a fascinating parallel because eagles are unique creatures. For one thing, they're incredibly aerodynamically designed, which means they can glide on air currents and with their incredible seven-foot wingspan, they don't have to flap their wings like other birds do all the time. They, can, they only flap their wings about 10% of the time that they're in the air, so they don't expend much strength, and they can stay up there for hours at a time. And note this too, when an eagle senses a storm is coming, Instead of coming down and taking shelter in a tree or in a cliff, what they'll often do is they'll use those massive wings and those air currents to, to fly even higher. And eagles can fly higher than almost any other bird. This is what he's talking about when Isaiah says they'll mount up with wings like eagles. He literally is talking about them ascending. And eagles can fly as high as 10 to 20,000 feet. They have unique blood, that hemoglobin that attaches to oxygen molecules that allows them to breathe freely up there and get above the storms down below. You can draw the parallels to your own story and your own life. When the storms come, we fly high. We get in the presence of Jesus. One more thing I found out that's pretty cool about eagles is they have three different lenses and they have this protective lens that allows them to, to look directly at the sun. It protects them from the UV rays and the brightness and all of that. So they can fly directly towards the sun. You say, why would they need that? Well, when they're being pestered by their natural enemy, the crow, and they're too big, the eagle is, to flip over and defend itself against the crow. And so they'll just direct their gaze at the light and fly straight towards the sun, getting higher than the pesky problems that bother them down low. What a powerful, powerful analogy. Scripture is so cool. God is so good. And when life is coming at you, when you feel yourself being bothered by attacks from the enemy, whether they be relational or emotional or psychological or physical, you just fly higher. You aim towards the son of God. You keep your eyes fixed on him and you'll get above those problems. He goes on to say, you'll run and not grow weary. 
Now, my wife is here, as I mentioned, and there was a season in our life where she liked to run, which by default meant, I guess, that I liked to run. You know, I don't know. <laughs> and we were runners, and we ran a few half marathons. We never did do a full, but I, I ran enough to know this experience. There's a common experience that runners will face where they hit the proverbial wall. If you're a runner, you know what I'm talking about, where your legs feel like they're encased in cement, and you can't draw a deep enough breath, and you just want to sit down in the middle of the race. And it's a common experience, but there's also another experience that you've no doubt had if you're a runner, and, and it's, this, it's equally as powerful. And it comes to you in that moment when you're ready to quit, and then you get this thing called a second wind. And I've experienced that too. And, and what the Lord is saying to us here through the prophet Isaiah is, when you wait on me, I'll renew your strength like the eagle, but I'll also give you a second wind so you can keep running the race that has been set before you. We each have a race to run. And my dad ran his race and he finished it well. And I don't know about you, but I want to finish the race that God has set before me. I don't want to crawl across the finish line with a whimper and a wheeze, but I want to run with the breath still in me and my flame still lit. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. And God says, I'm going to do that for you as you wait on me. And then he closes by saying, and you'll walk and not grow faint. Of course, the analogy or metaphor of walking with the Lord is a common one. We see it throughout scripture. And God says, essentially, I'm going to be with you every step of the day. So there are those times in life where you're just, you're soaring like an eagle. And God says, I'm with you. There are those times when you're running in your race and God says, I'm with you. And there are those times when you feel like it's all you can do to put one foot in front of the other. And God says, I'm with you there too. I'll close with this thought. Um, you know, I was, I was, uh, I'm in this new season and I've uh, assumed the, the senior pastor role at our church and, and there's just a, a whole lot of responsibilities that come with that, meetings and, and all kinds of things and I was finding myself getting overwhelmed and I was meeting with a friend and he was talking about how burnt out he was with his job and overwhelmed he was with his job and, and in that moment, God gave me a fresh perspective on things that, that has just ministered to my heart and I pray it ministers to your heart as well. And I said, you know, sometimes as I'm speaking to him, I'm saying, you know, sometimes I feel like a, a reservoir. And you just, you know what a reservoir is. We have a lot of reservoirs in California, one by our house. And it starts off full in the winter, but then there's, there's uh, withdrawals that get made. And as the water levels go down and down, it gets drained. And sometimes that feels like us, like a reservoir. I'm just being drained lower and lower. And I don't have anything left to give. And you come home at the end of a long day and, and you feel like there's been so many withdrawals that have been made from your account that you just feel like you're drained and there's nothing left to give to your wife or to your kids or to yourself to just spend time with the Lord. And, and as I'm sharing this with him, the Lord speaks to my heart in a whisper and says, you're not a reservoir, you're a river. You're a river. Now, both of these pictures are, are pictures of water, Right? And yet one has a renewable source. A river is, is fed by headwaters or perhaps by subterranean springs or artesian wells where there, it just bubbles up from underneath. And it reminded me in that moment of what Jesus said in John chapter 7. He said, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. And out of his innermost being will, will gush forth torrents of living water. And when you are relying on the strength that comes from waiting upon the Lord, you are being renewed day by day. And people can withdraw from your account all the time and they can't suppress the flow. Why? Because you can't deplete a river. The more you take, the more it's coming. And you can't be drained because there's a replenishing source. And so for anyone in here who finds themselves overwhelmed by life, overwhelmed by circumstances, overwhelmed by trials, hardship, or heartache, whatever it might be, let me encourage you to run to the feet of Jesus, who is your renewable source of not only energy, but Zoe, spiritual life, abundant life. This is what he came to give. And if, if you're just barely getting by, then let me encourage you, there is more 
More of him to know, more of him to experience, more of him to love, more of him to grow in. And as you grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you will mount up with those wings like eagles. You'll run and not grow weary. You'll walk and not grow faint.